Let's concentrate now on long haul. Um, our second discussion panel with Total Energies, it's the transformation of long haul transport, a heavy duty for Europe. So please welcome those to join this discussion panel. We have Dr. Jens Anderson, Secretary General of the NGVA. Good to see you there, Jens. More than 28 years experience in the automotive industry, 23 years experience in strategic and operational powertrain and vehicle projects. Um, also joining us, Johan Momberger, Business Development at uh, Bio LNG at Shell. Johan, thank you. Been at Shell since uh, 1990 several leadership roles in business development, sales management and marketing. John Wilson is joining us for this discussion, Vice President at Gas Mobility uh, from Total Energies. John responsible for the natural gas, renewable gas and hydrogen gas for mobility, as well as small scale LNG for industry and activities within the broad energy companies, marketing and services branch works on a global basis. Good to see you, John. Uh, joining us from DHL, we have Katerina Razlova, who's the BU Director, Auto Mobility. Extensive experience working in the uh, logistics supply chain industry and transport area, and that's a uh, supply chain optimization. It'll be interesting to hear what that has uh, uh, channeled your views, maybe, Katerina, for uh, the next uh, panel. Also joining us, Lars Martinson, Lars Environment and Innovation Director at Volvo Trucks, um, responsible for the environment and innovation strategies and objectives. And actually, before that, some seven years as the chairman of the Swedish network Climate Neutral Freight Transport. So uh, a lot to draw on there, Lars. Um, and Nadesh, Nadesh Leclerc, Director and Market Direct Development at Europe for Westport Fuel Systems. Nadesh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's a company that works with uh, manufacturers who are in turn working with light to heavy duty applications. So good to get your views as we go forward, talking about long haul transport and the transformation. And again, um, send us your views, your opinions on uh, the chat function and uh, we can uh, put all those to our panelists as we shape this discussion because there is a lot to get through. And I think uh, we've already outlined how tough a task this is, with indeed, particularly as we have heard from the last keynote speaker, not much time to do it in either. Uh, so Jens, let me start with you first. What's the biggest challenge that needs to be overcome? Where would you start us off? Well, the biggest challenge that has to be overcome, this, uh, this has already been mentioned earlier, we have to convince uh, the, uh, the uh, legislation uh, or the, the, the pol politicians in, in Brussels that is just uh, uh, looking at the tailpipe emissions is not enough because especially in the heavy duty sector we won't be able to cover everything with all electric. This is physically not possible and especially for, the, for long distances and heavy loads we have to make use of uh, uh, alternative fuels and in this case especially uh, a biomethane and very especially in, in liquid state is uh, uh, the solution that will, from my perspective, and this is what, what, what uh, many, many technicians and, and scientists are, are, are telling me, uh, will have uh, a strong future and this all brings also a strong contribution to carbon dioxide reduction. And it makes... And, one another challenge is to keep uh, transportation costs low. This is also very important, and uh, from my perspective, the contribution of, of bio LNG, especially, but also bio CNG, this de uh, uh, depends on the country you are looking at. Uh, the possibilities are immense, and we should create the framework in, in Europe in that kind of way that we can make use of this technology. I think this is this is the challenge or those are the challenges. Okay, Lars, I saw you nodding there with, with, with Jens. Uh, I, I'm assuming that's a nod of agreement, but what do you want to add as, as the greatest challenge? 
I think I can agree with Jens, but many other things that have been said here today. Uh, I will say that the main challenge is what, what I think Professor Wilner was very clear on, that is the, the speed that is needed here. Uh, and uh, in order to get that high speed, we of course need to take advantage of technologies that are available today and also, of course, fuels that are available today. Uh, and we definitely believe that uh, Bio-LNG is an important part of the solution today and also in the future. So, so to us, it's very much a challenge to, let's say, make clear to our customers, make clear to other stakeholders, including many energy companies, that bio-LNG is also a long-term part of the puzzle. We need to continue to grow bio-LNG and uh, sales of gas trucks. Mm. So speed, I think, and moving quickly and also convincing customers. I, I, yes. I, which actually was, you know, communication and education was something that came out of the first panel as well. Nadesh, let's come, come to you on this one. I mean, would you agree with your fellow, fellow panelists or is it something else you want to bring in? Uh, thank you, Sasha. Hi, everyone. Um, well, I would actually concur very much with, with um, what, what has been said. Um, and to me, uh, it, the cha- really the challenge we have today is that what is actually the most cost effective and practical low carbon solutions that are already in use today that are scaling uh, scaling up across Europe are not sufficiently recognized by the legislation and this is actually creating a risk to miss our carbon neutrality target, uh, as it was said before, because we can't afford to, be- to wait for new technologies to be to be ready to be scaled and to be affordable. We really need all of them, including these uh, great biomethane solutions that we have today. Uh, Katerina, from your point of view, with your, your wider context, would you agree with that? But it's it, it it is it is the regulation as well. Well, yes, but but not not, not only. Uh, uh, let's say uh, when we when we look at the Europe, uh, we have few countries they let's say support and uh, even subsidize uh, the using of uh, of LNG, for example, bio LNG a lot. But we have also countries where there is no support at all. So. Well, if we are talking about decarbonizing the fleet and we talk specifically about AGV, like then we as a business, we have to select and very choose uh, some particular areas or geographies where we implement the solution. And it's, let's say, uh, in a kind of uh, like when we compare it with the traditional fuel like diesel, I mean, the costs are higher, but sometimes where you have absolutely no support, uh, the costs are too high. Yeah. So definitely, yeah, it has an influence. Mm. So it's, it's, it's back to cost, but it's also back to the different geographies and the support. That As well. And the, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the support is, let's say, very fragmented across the different countries in Europe which has an influence on implementing the fleet yeah. for the alternative fuel. Which, which then has a direct influence. And, it, and it's really good to have you here with, you, with your experience, you know, coming from the standpoint that you are, you can see that it is directly impacting on basically the vehicles that you go and buy, <laughs> the ones that, that you, you put out on the road in, in different countries. John, what, what, what would you say to this? Um, I agree with pretty much everything that's uh, that's been said so far. I think I would add in perhaps the uh, the certainty aspect because to invest in this technology, whether it's trucks that Katerina will need to do or stations that we need to do, um, obviously we're we tend to be averse to investing in something that we don't see what it, what the the, out, the long term outlook is. Um, if we're investing in a network as we are, we have two hundred some something stations uh, in NGV today. We want to build that out. We want certainty that in 5, 10, 15 years, there's still a business behind it. Obviously, we think there is still a business behind it. And we've heard from everybody else that it's, it, it really is the way today to drop your, uh, your carbon emissions quickly. So some regulatory certainty that that will be the case, you know, that this will be the case, that this will be taken into account in the carbon counting is, uh, is only going to help. It'll help uh, people like DHL uh, know that they'll get their money's worth from their, their trucks and it'll help us service uh, those trucks in building out our network. 
I, it's, you know, the point you've just made, John, is uh, an argument and an opinion that I've heard many times before. Um, you need the, you know, the, the certainty of what's going to happen, but it is possible to do. Um, it, it always sounds to me it's a bit chicken and egg situation. It's almost, you know, what comes first and who should almost, you know, go forward first. Do you need the regulations for you to to expand and, and to invest the regulatory certainty? Or could you not do that and therefore prove that it can be done and the success and then have that regulated? Do you, do you see where, where I'm coming from? I mean, you know, it's, it's almost pushing forward. I think the chicken and the egg is uh, that, that cycle has been broken. It sh- we've shown already ourselves and our competitors and the uh, the clients who are using trucks, the OEMs, that it can and does work. Um, what we do need to do is persuade more uh, clients. The clients who are coming to us and saying, "I have to become carbon neutral," well, obviously we're saying, "Well, here's your answer: it's biomethane." Um, but again, there's this thing of. Uh, can I use that biomethane for five, 10 years? If I buy my trucks today and tomorrow the European Commission says, oh, well, do you know what? We want to phase out the internal combustion engine, then we have an issue. Um, and we've just heard from Professor uh, Willer, Willner that uh, that's really not the way to go if we want to, uh, to reach our, our climate targets. Johan, let's, let's hear from you. Where, where do you sit in this debate? Yeah, I'm buying, buying very much uh, uh, on the arguments uh, shared before. Um, basically, uh, what I'm currently seeing, and uh, I had uh, today a discussion with a customer like that as well, is uh, there's a switch uh, in the market uh, in the customer perception from price buyers. No? So LNG was uh, pretty attractive uh, in uh, specific countries uh, towards uh, decarbonizers. So it's not any longer the carriers taking the decisions, but basically the shippers, yeah? So, so uh, basically, companies like us with big, big uh, transport requirements, uh, and uh, so all of those customers are usually uh, looking uh, straight forward to a European proposition. So, therefore, when we uh, talk about an offer uh, um, with regards to bio LNG, those customers are looking for a European proposition and, and not just a proposition from country to country. And that obviously has something to do, do, to do with the legislation, uh, rollout of biomethane, uh, Europe-wide, and so on, uh, to support uh, this proposition. And tell me more about your customers and the shippers and who, who it is that, not, sorry, not who, but what it is that they are looking for. You, I think you're suggesting they're looking for certainty. Um, they're they're looking for for their own measurements and what are they? What are, who are your customers and what is it that they need? Yeah. So the first thing they need to understand is if they if they are allowed in the future to transport their goods, uh, for instance, uh, when we talk about uh, let's take supermarkets, it's a good idea, huh? We have supermarkets in our neighborhoods, yeah. And the question is, uh, so the, the supermarkets are close by to our homes, isn't it? So the question is uh, if they can supply, as we uh, heard before. Uh, the products uh, still to to the supermarket. So that's their their core question, their first question. No? And then the second question for them is uh, how expensive uh, is the change? Yeah, and uh, what does it mean to my log- to my logistical processes? So what is the impact here? No, and usually they are looking forward uh, to uh, to scalable uh, to scalable solutions, which they can quickly basically convert within their within their um, logistical processes. Yeah. Uh, N- N- Nadesh, um, where do you want to stand on that one? I mean, do you agree with that? Is that what customers need? Uh, yes. Uh, talking about the end customers, the fleets, Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Uh, I-, I could summarize it uh, with uh, the idea that the fleets need practical solutions uh, that deliver the performance they need in a cost-effective way. And and today, uh, biomethane trucks fulfill that uh, very well already. As it was said, uh, what is uh, missing is more the right signal from uh, the policies uh, at at European level uh, that this is a solution, not only uh, very short term, but that it it has a future. And and I would like to add to that one one thing, uh, because... um, Looking at tomorrow and the solutions for tomorrow, um, 
today um, we there's a lot of discussion about electrification and and as we have heard a little bit already hydrogen is often seen as a new el dorado to achieve zero tailpipe emissions with with fuel cell vehicles and um, actually we we believe that hydrogen internal combustion engines are also attractive for particularly for this whole long haul segment um and wh why is it so so interesting uh in light of, of this discussion uh it's all already because it's about internal combustion engines. It's not the end of internal combustion engines. And, and we see very exciting results with, with uh, hydrogen internal combustion engines. Uh, but also, this has a lot of synergies with the current uh, gas vehicles. Um, so really playing with both and with all the solutions we have will help us better deliver more quickly on decarbonization. And, and I think that's uh, really a, a way to fulfill tomorrow's needs as well as today's needs. Yeah, and so let's come back to you on that one. It, it, it's, it can almost be summed up by keeping that sort of technological open mind uh, and, and different solutions and, uh, uh, as well, different solutions for, di for different areas. Um, as uh, NGVA Europe, we are representing truck manufacturers, but also component suppliers. And especially when I look at the, at the uh, uh, truck business, although I, my, my, my roots are in the vehicle industry, um, uh, let's take a look at a, at a vehicle customer passenger car uh, manufacturer who manufactures 10 million uh, uh, vehicles per year all over, all, all over the globe on, on a bunch of uh, really many locations. Uh, compared to truck manufacturers, this is a totally different business. Uh, so in the passenger vehicle uh, sector, you have facilities in certain uh, areas of the globe and in the truck uh, business where you then manufacture, let's say, some hundreds of thousands of, of trucks, uh, there the situation is different. And we as Europe, we are an area of exporting products into the world and we have to cover different necessities in each regions and uh, the requirements in South America and Brazil are totally different regarding transportation uh, compared to Australia or compared to the United States but the uh, truck manufacturers I'm representing they have to cover all these needs or we won't <laughs> we won't come to the point that we have will have only one single propulsion solution so we have to make use of what we have and to a certain extent we are also importing our technology and we need to keep our knowledge uh, on level and to, to uh, also to develop our knowledge, our engineering knowledge further. And when it comes to synergies, what, what uh, Nadej just mentioned, uh, this is also a topic, there are many synergies on component side. Uh, uh, inside these European tech companies we had in the first panel, they are working on CNG as well as on LPG and as well as on hydrogen and there uh, and, and for example for the storage systems there are strong synergies possible and in the business it's always about economies of scales and when you have this possibility then you can achieve something for the company but also for for Europe for, and for the indus industry in Europe. Katerina you're on the sharp end of this you know, and, and you listen, I'm sure, sitting there to, to all these, these conversations going on of, you know, what the industry is, is saying. And you're on, it's not the other side, but you're in a slightly different context. Um, how do you see this playing out? Which way do you feel the wind is blowing? Well, uh, I think, uh, let's say, the, what fuel is going to be used in the future, I think it will be purpose-driven. Well, um, right now, the technologies available for the real use, like a real operation. So you, you can buy the truck, run it, and, and make some business with that. Uh, the, the only way you, you can do is, is a natural gas. But there is a total lack of, let's say, using a biogas. There are some, let's say, companies that are using blended uh, versions. But let's say really to get... Uh, a biogas in, into into the LNG trucks. It's it's a uh, like a it's hard. Yeah, we we have uh, several meetings with several companies. The market is is a bit different than like 
the market with um, uh, with diesel. Uh, for uh, and when we look at the hydrogen, the AGV trucks uh, using hydrogen for let's say wider use in a in a long haul transportation, it will take at least five six years. Then you can really go and buy it and use it. Yeah. Well, when you when you look at the the biogas, yes, it is a solution. But really, when we wanna when we wanna look at the whole Europe, um, the investments uh, into the let's say uh, mm, infrastructure and let's say uh, distribution of a bio LNG, it is a question. But well, let's look at it like seven years ago. I cannot imagine that. Now we run like almost two years LNG fleet. Yeah, so it's yeah. Right, and uh, uh, e mobility and e trucks and uh, AGV long haul, respective. Uh, and I, back to, to the hydrogen, hydrogen had a quite good perspective uh, for the long haul because when we really look at a kilometer range, like thousand kilometers, it is something like we can, we can use in the business. Uh, in comparison with e trucks, so far 300 200 kilometers, it will has its use. In the cities, in the like a larger agglomeration around the cities and so on, for particular type of business, but for a long haul, right now, and with the perspective, maybe two three years, it's a question. Yeah, it's like distances like six hundred, seven hundred thousand kilometers. Yeah. And that is what you need to be looking at. And that's that's what, yeah. And then that, that's that's where you're coming from. Um, Lars, I, I saw a very thoughtful look on your face, an occasional nod, but uh, thinking about it. Um, I mean, the challenge also that uh, Katerina is alluding to is, is the infrastructure as, as well, and it's everything else that, 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 that plays into it. Um, so where do you stand? On, on that, on companies having to make decisions on, you know, some of the areas that Katarina's just been talking about and wondering how to work their way through. I think uh, if I share a couple of learnings that we have uh, got from uh, like working with the gas trucks, I would say to, mean, to start with, it's quite clear that we need to work close with our customers in order for them to, let's say, accept and understand new technologies, understand that they will still be profitable and the performance and, and uptime will be there as well. And we also, of course, need to work very close to the energy companies because we together need to, let's say, approach many of the customers and also need to make sure that the infrastructure is in place uh, at the same time as we are growing the volumes. But, but I would say the third key area that was mentioned briefly as well is that we also need to influence and work close together with the big transport buyers uh, because with them, we can really also make sure that we have let's say, a more long-term perspective. So, so the new thing here is really to, well, on one hand, there's new ways that we need to cooperate in order to grow this over time. Uh, on the other hand, we also need to understand, just like Katarina explained here, that the different technologies, different energies play different roles for different types of applications. Uh, I have to admit that for, from a mobile trucks perspective, we sell today five different electric truck models here in Europe and one from North America. And we expect that to grow a lot in the future. At the same time, we also expect the, our gas engines and our gas trucks to grow a lot going forward. But what we need to keep in mind at the same time is that what we decrease step by step every day going forward is the number of uh, diesel engines and diesel trucks. So different types of applications and a tremendous growth, especially when it comes to electric mobility, but also a big, big growth when it comes to gas trucks using energy from renewable sources. Excellent. I mean, do you, I mean, where, where is your focus you know, where where do you see the biggest growth? And actually, where do you need to see the biggest growth? Where does your attention need to be? I would say that uh, since it's quite clear that we, we need to move faster, I would say that the biggest growth is to stop with needed in uh, bio-LNG. 
Uh, because as we said earlier, that initially many of our customers and our customers' customers, they they saw LNG as, let's say, a first step on the, the decarbonization journey with the benefits that uh, can be achieved there, but also from a cost perspective. But going forward, bio-LNG is really the, the long-term solution that we need to aim for. Uh, and there we need to really demonstrate that, that there is a growth in that. Otherwise, I would say that, that there could be a hesitance in, let's say, going in that direction. So we really, really to uh, put focus on bioenergy and grow the availability of bioenergy. Okay, um, let's. We're, we're, we're nearly out of time, so I, I just want to do a quick round of all of you of, of what you really think the future is. So, I mean, I, I think Lars, you, you've summed up where where you feel it is for you. Um, Johan was nodding as you were saying that, so let me come to you next, Johan. You know. Where do you see the future specifically? Just if, if you can cast your mind ahead 12 months and tell me where you believe you and Shell will be and what you will be doing and what you'll be focusing on 12 months from now. So this time next October. Yeah, perfect. So the first thing is the offer with regards to infrastructure, as we uh, heard before. In the meantime, we have uh, already opened 14 L- 40 LNG sites uh, in okay, seven one. countries. Um, that should double in 12 months, Perfect. yeah, and I see the pace, so I'm not worry, worried anymore for the infrastructure throughout Europe when it comes to LNG sites, yeah. I think uh, the second step, and uh, we have done the first step, and in 2023, uh, the second will be done with regards to bio-LNG. So bio-LNG first uh, requires the biomethane and then the liquefaction, yeah, and uh, the inauguration of the first plant uh, you might have witnessed uh, last week, actually, in the Netherlands. No? The next one is to come uh, in Germany, but that is not enough. There has to come much, much more. And uh, basically, we have to de-bottleneck, basically, uh, the biomethane and uh, the liquefaction of, uh, of the molecule. And that throughout Europe. Okay, Nadesh, let me come to you. Um, 12 months from now, where would you like to be? And maybe... Uh, Keep in your mind the fact that we are trying to get to climate neutrality as well. So where would you like to be in 12 months? Well, I would like to be uh, looking at climate neutrality exactly. Uh, I would like to see regulations that uh, get away from this tailpipe only um, um, consideration. Um, and that means uh, we will have regulations that really take us to carbon neutrality as we need, uh, and that take into consideration uh, that uh, carbon abate, uh, the solutions that have the lowest carbon abatement cost, like biomethane, uh, need uh, to be uh, to be favoured. And also, uh, we talk a lot about zero emission vehicles, but. Um, uh, we should also consider that uh, there is a cost uh, for for the, these emissions, and and we have done an analysis that shows that there is an extremely high uh, cost of uh, NOx abatement, for example, uh, particularly for for long haul applications when you want to electrify rather than uh, using, uh, for example, uh, uh, biomethane um, internal combustion engines. So. We have just completed this analysis and and I would very much like to see that in the regulations uh, to have a policy that really enables the the full portfolio of technologies that we need. Okay, Uh, Katerina, to to you, I know you're coming at this from a a slightly different angle, but um, 12 months from now, thinking of climate neutrality, thinking of DHL, what, what, what would you like? What would you like to see? Well, uh, I can't even say it's like what we're gonna do. Yeah, I mean, within a within a year, there will be definitely enhancing of uh, LNG fleet. I have to say that uh, when I compared it when we started, uh, the OEMs made a quite uh, kind of development in a, in a technical, let's say, solution, and the effectiveness of the engines is is now much better. Uh, that's true. I wish uh, that the bio LNG is really accessible. Because it's not the case right now, and it's not accessible only in Western Europe. It's also ex- accessible in Eastern Europe. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, because there, there's a lot of lot of flow uh, in the transportation going from east to west. Yeah, so we should not forget this. And uh, yeah, Sorry. that's it. 
Okay, we're just looking at the at the geography. It's a, it's a very interesting point. It's not just the range, but it's the geography and it, and it's 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 the locations. Um, well, John, that that perfectly leads us leads us on, on to you. Twelve months from now, um, and thinking of in the back of your mind, actually probably in the forefront of your mind, climate neutrality. Uh, what would you like to have accomplished? Um, we'd like to see also this uh, regulatory certainty, uh, particularly on the, uh, the heavy duty field, so that we can invest uh, as we uh, we need to, to to follow our clients, clients like DHL, clients like other big transport uh, and shipping uh, companies. Um, we'll be building out uh, both CNG and LNG um, and building on the, uh, the investments that we've made in biomethane to, uh, I would hope, to start looking at liquefaction projects for that, if not uh, actually having them up and running okay. uh, that on, on a Europe-wide basis. John, thank you. Um, Jens, just, I, I know obviously you, you'll be you'll be talking more about this in just a moment, uh, about the way ahead, but just with your mind on, on you know, long-haul transport, um, what would you like to see in 12 months? Clearly, that uh, we become uh, a legislation framework uh, that is, uh, uh, looks at the CO2 emissions in total, uh, well to wheel and not at the tailpipe, and the European uh, uh, Union kicks off um, a campaign regarding investments in biomethane and also in propulsion systems running on natural gas and, and especially biomethane so that there's a stable fundament that uh, our industry can move forward and uh, accelerate the decarbonization. As we heard it also from, from Professor Vilna, uh, uh, speed is necessary. I'm not waiting for the, for the, for the nice solution in, in, in 10 years or so. This is what I would like to, to have. <laughs> Speed, very, very necessary, very, very much so, yeah. very much at the forefront of everyone's minds. Okay, uh, Jens, John, Katerina, Lars, Nadesh, and Johan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for giving us some of your time this afternoon. It's good to hear all your, your views and your opinions. Thank you.